Welcome to Oz Talk. I am so excited to be sitting here with fellow Oz historian Ryan Jay to discuss all things Oz, and it's spooky season! And I'm with the Oz Vlogs, Tori Calamito, and can I just say what's new in Oz, or what's news in Oz, is the Oz Vlog on TikTok, because I am so impressed by and proud of you for everything that you've got going on on TikTok. You are amazing, and not that this Oz Talk episode needs to be a love fest, but I do love you as much as I love Oz. And I'm thrilled that you were able to join me in watching a press screener of the new short horror film, Gale, Stay Away From Oz, inspired by Return to Oz. And we're going to be joined in just a little bit by Gale director Daniel Alexander for a short interview. This one has had a lot of buzz for a long time. The teaser trailer was released a year ago and fans have been wondering, where the heck is this thing? Well, it's here and it's ready for you to watch. It won lots of awards and went viral. He even wrote this on his Instagram. I'm happy to announce that after a really positive response to our trailer for Gail, I can now announce that we have partnered with American company Chilling and we go into production next year. The trailer received millions of views across TikTok, 600,000 and rising on YouTube, won endless amounts of awards, interviewed by publications in loads of countries, offered many deals, and was also featured on all the major horror platforms across the world, alongside every blockbuster feature film released in cinemas globally. Chilling is the number one app for horror stories and merging into the ultimate horror streaming platform worldwide. And together we will produce a short version of the story, which will launch next year and be used as a means to develop a feature film from it. So just a little bit more information about Chilling, which is a streaming app for horror fans. It's founded by Christopher Graham and Dane Petrali. And this is Chilling's mission statement. Chilling gives independent creators a platform to share content and compete against studios that create generic material just to hit metrics and sell tickets. Our agile production process puts control back in the hands of the diverse and loyal horror community by allowing them to give and receive feedback. Content is then co-created based on shared ideas and the wants of diehard horror fans. As this content gains engagement, Chilling will professionally produce it. With audience previews and feedback mechanisms looped into every step, we have the potential to make wasteful entertainment industry practices virtually obsolete. I'm so glad we actually read that mission statement because I had so many people reach out to me on TikTok to say, I've never heard of this app. What is it for? Well, here it is. They're streamlining the horror industry to skip through the red tape because a lot of really bad horror movies get made. And this basically weeds out the bad ones and allows the good ones to get produced. It's true. And I, I love that, you know, the teaser for Gail and the concept was viral. So it let them know this is something that's popular. We know for a long time, Oz has lent itself to dark adaptation. There have been collectibles and retellings. And even before its time, we saw Return to Oz, which came across much darker than the world or audiences were prepared for it at the time. It was very ahead of its time. So I love that he struck while the iron is hot and partnered with Chilling. And it sounds like Chilling will accept feedback. So if this, uh, if, it, if this short film now does well, if everybody streams it on Chilling, we might see more or even a feature length version of this film. And why not? Let's take a look at the trailer. Just relax. Listen to the sounds. The tempo. And just picture yourself there. In your dreams. Can you see it? Talk, tick, talk, tick, 
Are you there? Yes. Yes. Gail. You're Emily Gail. Yes. And you say you're a relation of Dorothy's? I don't know. Maybe. What you have there is a handwritten early draft of Dorothy's first book. Her writings were all based on her dreams of a place. Us. I feel this is the best chance we have to unlocking all of this. To finding the truth. The truth? Yes, about Dorothy, the slippers. Stay away from us! Stay away from us! Stay Your dreams, they're the key to all of this. Where am I? Let's start at the beginning, and then you can learn for yourself. So, when I posted this trailer on my TikTok, it too went viral with over a million views. Now, for me, that's a lot in a day. That was in 24 hours. And people are really excited about this movie. And now having seen the whole thing, I can't wait to talk about it with you. Daniel Alexander, we're so excited to welcome you to Oz Talk. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Thank you. Very humble. Welcome. What inspired you to make an Oz horror film? So the inspiration came from being absolutely terrified by the return to Oz as a child and growing up and realizing how dark films actually were <laughs> when I was a lot um, younger and just falling in love with the, that, that whole Oz universe and wanting it to continue, hence making what would probably feel more like a sequel as opposed to a remake. So yeah, so it all, it, it kind of all stemmed from there. And then once getting a little bit older and, and understanding that, hold on, this is actually from a series of books and, and realizing that there's a lot of source material that goes way deeper than I even ever imagined. It just, it was just a playground for, for my mind to go, okay, this is something I wanna um, venture into. The one thing I'm always very curious about when a new director takes on an Oz project is what was your first exposure in media to Oz? What was the first Oz thing you saw? Um, I, I guess I guess it was the original movie. I think I would have assumed. So. Yeah, I think it would, would be the, the original movie. And and maybe, yeah, I'm trying, I, I, it must have been, it must have been the original movie. I mean, it's such a long time ago, but it's, uh, it, it's something that plays out in my mind so vividly. And in fact, no, it wasn't, I actually, it's, that's a lie, it wasn't the original movie. I remember there was a, a crazy little spin-off of the actual movie and it looked kind of like a pantomime. And I remember seeing a witch and, uh, and Toto running around and I was just kind of curious like what the hell is this and I think that kind of inspired me to be exposed to the, the original film and then I was kind of like hooked from that point on it was just a, this magical world where it's just like oh okay this is this was cool. Pantomime is something you have in the UK that we don't have here so you're saying that was like a live stage production? Yes but it was televised I believe and it was um, it, it was done in a way where it was quite fantastical and it, it just kind of gripped me and then it was just the inspiration to kind of look a little bit further. So, so yeah, I forgot that. It's a, it's a very British thing, isn't it, kind of So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, meanwhile, what really occurred in the adaptation process to make the changes between the trailer and the short film? Okay, so essentially it was just having the scope to better tell the story that I wanted to tell. So with the original trailer, it was more of a proof of concept. It was me using the resources that I had, like literally picking up my camera and um, bringing together a bunch of friends and t having a taste of the world that I wanted to kind of develop because I've always had the story there, the, the, the full length story in my head. Um, once we tried to tackle the short film, 
it allowed me to kind of venture a little bit deeper in a sense of setting the tone slightly, um, moving around certain characters, moving around the, the plot slightly to kind of better reflect the beginning of the larger story that I want to tell. So yeah, just having a bit more exposure to, I don't know, production value essentially allowed me to kind of tell the story in a, in a bit more authentic way to what I want to tell for the bigger um, version. So now you're an established Oz fan. What <laughs> Oz media do you think influenced you the most in the making of Gale? Um, that is a good one. I do you, Okay, do you know what's really crazy? And it might not even be the answer that you're looking for. I had years and years and years and years ago, I had a little figurine of TikTok, the character TikTok. And it just sat on my table for a very long time. And I used to, every time that I looked at it, it was almost like a reminder of escapism, um, of, of storytelling and kind of fueled my passion for, for telling stories that aren't necessarily based in the real world. Um, so I think that was literally my hook into the, the, the way that I'm kind of <laughs> in love with the franchise right now. Do you still have that figure? No, I lost it. I lost it. Uh -huh. And I'm so mad. Because, you know, was... Tori and I would have to duke each other out over who gets it. <laughs> <laughs> that would probably, probably quite worth something at this point, especially if like it's in it your I feel like it might have been. I feel like it might have been. So yeah. quick follow-up question then. Is that metronome? Is that a little hint to our, our mechanical friend there? Maybe, maybe. <laughs> Well, do you know what? There, there are so many layers within the short film that I've tried to add a, a certain kind of level where if you if you look, there are definitely hints. Um, and Matt Ford, um, the writer who, who, who kind of took the story and, and turned it into a, a working screenplay um, with his genius mind, has, has managed to kind of pull those things out and those ideas and implement them in. So, you know, talking about the metronome, if you listen to what she says very carefully, she actually may or may not refer to a, a few characters. So, you know, on second watch, third watch, there's definitely things that we can we can pick up on. I picked up on a lot of what I see as influences or Easter eggs from Return to Oz, MGM's The Wizard of Oz, maybe even a little bit Oz the Great and Powerful. Um, but my favorite moment came, um, spoiler alert, at the end where there's a kiss of David Shire's score from Return to Oz, and that made me want to stand up and cheer. How did that come about, Daniel? by complete accident when I stumbled upon it and it was an original piece that was obviously inspired it it was just like okay this is meant to be and I remember when this was before I even shot the film and I was just trying to put together a few musical pieces and a few um you know sounds and just creating a library of things to kind of influence the, the creative process and that was literally one of the first things that I I stumbled across and I was just like whoa okay this is this is meant to be let's let's turn the camera on let's roll now Toto is one of the most iconic members of the Oz community. So is there a reason why Emily didn't have a pet or a companion? Yeah, it's, it's because I think with the, first of all, with the bigger story that I want to tell, there's definitely going to be some introductions where that question will be answered a lot better. But with the short film, I was very conscious of not trying to um, jam pack everything in there for the sake of putting it in there, if that makes sense. I was very keen to try and remain quite faithful to um, the story, to, to some of the source material, and also allowing room for things to grow. Like, it, it was so tempting to put so much into the short, but I had to keep reminding myself that this is the intro to the bigger story. And, we, you know, we have time, and it, I feel like it will be a better reveal once we actually get to that world. I feel like... There's a lot of significance in the names. Emily, of course, being a family name handed down through the Gale line from Auntie M. What mm -hmm. is the significance of Elizabeth? Uh, so this is where I relied heavily on Matthew, the writer. So he spent so much time researching the um, previous source materials and had so many um, concepts of where names have come from and drawing from names that have been mentioned and, and created this whole, like, I wish I could show you the document where he's created like a, a, a complete family tree. Um, so the names have been plucked out from a, a real timeline. So, I mean, to get the specifics, I probably kind of have to go back into that document and tell you because he's a lot better at that than I am. It's so magical. I dare anyone to watch this Gale now streaming on Chilling and not want to demand more immediately after because you ended the short film with To Be Continued. So does that mean that we're going to see possibly a feature length film or a sequel that's like a chapter short film to this Gale? Yeah, so we, we're definitely moving ahead with the feature film. So the, the short film is essentially where, where the short film ends is essentially where the feature film will start. 
So, you know, without trying to give too much away, we're bringing an audience up to the point where they're about to enter into the, the, the magical, mystical world that we are about to create with the future film. Thank you so much for joining us today. And we look forward to the great response for the short film on Chilling and to the feature length film and hopefully many sequels because there's certainly a lot of source material. And I know Oz fans everywhere look back to Baum's original books. Return to Oz was based on books two and three. You're taking that in direction. So, you know, hopefully many sequels could incorporate more of Baum's original characters and keep giving us those great Easter eggs. That is the plan. And thank you so much for you know, watching the film and hope that you enjoyed it and hope that many more people do as well. Thank you so much. Awesome. Thank you. I really enjoyed it. I think it's very obvious after seeing it how it's really a response to Return to Oz as, as opposed to being a dark Wizard of Oz. So to me, a dark Wizard of Oz would be taking Dorothy, you know, telling the story, you know, as is Dorothy going in a tornado to Oz, meeting the Scarecrow, Tin Man and Lion, et cetera, and just being very scary. Cause that, that in of itself could be scary. But this is almost, I think a sequel to Return, not even almost, it's, it's a sequel to Return to Oz that takes place generations later. Uh, it starts with a younger Gail named Emily and she's kind of like Dorothy in Return to Oz, goes and seeks help for these dreams. In Return to Oz, obviously Dorothy is saying they're not dreams. Here, uh, this Emily is having bad dreams and there's imagery and sound that is very reminiscent of what we are familiar with from Return to Oz. The biggest comment I received was, oh my gosh, the wheelers, no, my nightmares. So definitely- a great, definitely a great way to tie back into the nightmare fuel that Return to Oz was for an entire generation of children. And also, I'm glad they went with the name Emily for Emily Gale, that implying that Auntie M's name was still a family name carried down generations later. Like, that's a really great Easter egg for Oz fans. And you mentioned how people were reacting to the Wheelers being like their night, their, their childhood nightmares. Um, I never found the Wayne Monkeys and the Wizard of Oz scary. But I met an artist recently in Chicago who depicted the winged monkeys who terrified him as a child. He depicted them in his artwork, how they appeared to him. And I never saw them this way, but if this is how you saw them, I can understand why you found them terrifying. Whoa. Right? That's a pretty scary wing monkey, right? It's right. His name is Hal Betzold and he's phenomenal. And I, I got this piece and another one that he did. He's gonna be doing some more Oz art soon. Yeah, I'm also in the camp of people that was never scared of The Wizard of Oz or Return to Oz. Neither of those films hit me in that way, but I can see why it did. And the Oz books were already dark in tone in some ways. L. Frank Baum always wrote very gently, but those dark nuances were already there. So Oz is a natural fit in terms of adapting a story to the horror genre. I think some other films have tried to shoehorn children's IP. Winnie the Pooh is a good example of a thing that really doesn't have any malice and trying to force it into a horror scene didn't really work. But Oz kind of already has that baked into it. So it was kind of a natural fit. It's true. I think what I what I really like about this is that it is something where there's so much potential for where Oz could go that I hope that they get to explore it more and do a feature length because I feel like getting some more character development for Emily and knowing you know, who she is, where she comes from, what she does for a living. Does she live alone? Does she have a pet? This might be a great opportunity to introduce uh, Eureka or some other kind of uh, pet, if not a dog, you know, if you don't want to give her a Toto or something. And there is a music box that's playing that made me think of the music box in Oz the Great and Powerful. And especially within that notebook that she had with the original manuscript, there was so much baked into it. And I would love to actually sit down and pause and watch and see what was in there, what nuggets are in there. Um, right. I think not doing a direct analog of The Wizard of Oz was a very good choice. I feel like it's been done many times and that would have felt a little, I, I feel like that would have felt a little predictable. This does feel like an extension of Return to Oz. It's kind of a natural place for it to go. I agree. I think it's a really, really smart choice, especially because Return to Oz became such the cultural phenomenon, right? The, the, it has the cult following where it's more popular now and, and people get it now more than when it was released in 1985. And so this, this is kind of like, again, 
really tapping into the right time with the right material and to see it depicted in a way that is intentionally scary is very effective. The challenge here, I think, is that it's Oz on a budget, right? It's not a big budget uh, film. And when you're trying to depict Oz or doing effects that, that are practical, which can be done very effectively, and there's some effective moments here, you just can imagine what they might be able to do with more money in terms of the scares. I think this was kept more in the category of like what we saw with like paranormal activity movies where it's sound and editing or lighting effects that create some of the scares in this film as opposed to uh, bigger opportunities. I do appreciate the cinematography. I think this was photographed beautifully mm -hmm. and I appreciate the good use they made of the sets that they had. They only had a couple of locations, but they really made the most of the locations they had. And I can really appreciate that. But it was challenged in terms of the scare level. And that does really come down to budget and special lack of special effects. Mm -hmm. I think now that they have this film, which is intended to raise funds to make a feature length version of this, I'd be really excited to see how far they can push the envelope. I really hope they go further than jump scares. Jump scares get yeah. cheap, yeah. but I would really like to see them explore the deep and darker elements of the Land of Oz because there's plenty there to explore. I agree, I agree. If you explore those characters and the situations, it really can be terrifying. So that would be really, really cool to see. Another really strong, great strong point in this short film is the lighting is gorgeous. So along with the cinematography, it is made incredibly well and Anytime you use music with Oz, it's an opportunity to do something brilliant or it's a missed opportunity if you don't, you know, as is the case with Oz the Great and Powerful, which didn't do anything spectacular with music. Um, and you see the most successful Oz projects like Wicked, The Wizard of Oz, The Wiz have become so successful in great part due to the music. Here, I was underwhelmed initially by the score, but I will tell you by the end, it gave me my favorite moment of all. And I think you noticed it too. It harkens back to, and there is an actual element of um, David Shire's score that is placed very intentionally in a moment. And it just like that, that brings you to Oz. I mean, you know, as, as more than anything else can. They clearly knew the source Ooh. material. And as an Oz historian, that is the stuff I live for and want to see more of. When a project is in the hands of somebody who really cares about the source material, you can read that pretty easily, even if it means that it's not the big budget. I mean, one of my criticisms of Disney's Oz the Great and Powerful was that this big conglomerate didn't understand the point of the Land of Oz and its deeper thematic meaning. And because of that, it didn't succeed for me. But the folks who made this film clearly understand the lore and want to do it justice. And for me, that is everything. So while I would say that this struggled in terms of grandiosity and cinema cinematic elements that would be remedied by a bigger budget, it really hit the Aussian nail on the head. It really did. We, and, you know, we're both um, Oz purists in the sense that we are you know, our our work stems from our greatest love for all things Oz, but uh, we also allow for adaptation and interpretation and reimagining and all the rest of that stuff. So how did you feel about the el elimination of L. Frank Baum within the world of this short film? Unlike a lot of people who come into my comment section on TikTok, I am not the kind of person who says, this thing is perfect, so it should never be touched again. I actually really believe that is a very problematic way of thinking about old literature, classic literature. If we don't allow for reinterpretation on artistic license and recreation of works we love, they will eventually inevitably get lost to time. Nothing lasts forever, even things we really love. If we don't keep reimagining Oz, it will just be that old movie and kids won't be drawn to it. Younger families won't be drawn to it. The books will be forgotten. They already are to an extent. So my goal here is let's keep talking about Oz. Let's keep reimagining Oz. I'm okay moving away from L. Frank Baum because L. Frank Baum himself was okay with moving away from L. Frank Baum. He was constantly rewriting and reimagining on in stage adaptations and film versions he made. He himself was not married to his own lore. His 
books, in my opinion, have no canonical consistency whatsoever. They're all over the place. And that's because he was more interested in telling a good story than telling a consistent canon. So right. let's all be like L. Frank Baum and let's do it again. Just different this time. I agree. And I, I agree wholeheartedly. And partly because it's something where, you know, doing something new and different doesn't eliminate or take away from what already exists. I remember initially being really upset when Wicked changed its marketing for the Broadway or for, you know, for the musical tour and Broadway to you know, from the untold story of the Witches of Oz to the, to the untold true story of the Witches of Oz or real story. And I, that irked me because I was like, it's not true because like, you know, it, it, the ending in the Wizard of Oz is real. You know, it's not like so I was upset for a, a heartbeat. But then, no, it doesn't eliminate what's there. And already exists there's room on our bookshelves for both wicked and the wizard of oz there's room in our dvd or streaming libraries you know digital libraries for the wizard of oz return to oz and gail stay away from oz it doesn't take away if you you know you can always always revisit and watch what already exists and like you said this is just building upon reinventing, making it something that continues the conversation about that which we love so much. So I, I agree with you. I'm all for it. I always remind people that the 1939 classic that we all consider to be the original Wizard of Oz was not the original Wizard of Oz. And audiences at the time were like, why aren't they just adapting the 1902 stage play that everybody loves? Why mess with perfection? And then they made this movie and it was perfection. And when Return to Oz came out, they're like, why are we rewriting The Wizard of Oz? It was perfection. And now it's a beloved cult classic. So leave room to love new things. It's okay. And the, the 1939 film that we all hold up as the standard for the best Oz film was itself a remake. So... Right. And if you just look at the, the way it was adapted from the book, it is, as far as books adaptations go, one of the most vastly different. I mean, new characters, other characters, things so much cut out. You know, we look at another hot property that at the time was so, so adapted so um, tightly were the Harry Potter franchise. Right. And fans were so strong about not wanting things changed. So things were eliminated, but nothing was really different or changed because that would have created havoc within the fandom. So I think we see what can be accomplished when you make great changes like MGM's film. It's a perfect movie that stems from, in its own way, a perfect novel that both have you know, created a fandom that crosses generations and cultures and so many barriers on and on for a reason because you at the at the heart of it it's good storytelling people believe in it and it's entertaining so so, so true and i yeah. feel that gail will be yet another reinterpretation that audience will probably buck against for a bit and then go huh there was some interesting stuff here now yes. again in the span of this short film i don't feel the characters were as fleshed out as they could have been and i'm hoping that that gets remedied in the full-length feature film that will be made from the funding from this short film release so to that end please go head over to chilling check out gail stay away from oz let us know what you think of it let the people at chilling know what you think of it all right next uh let's talk about you know the whiz coming back to Broadway, I just bought my ticket last night for the stop in Chicago. It's going on this uh, national tour before heading to Broadway in the spring of 2024. So you can learn all about it and get tickets at whizmusical.com. They also recently announced who is in the cast. This is a magnificently strong cast. They're on Instagram at the Wiz B Way. I'm so glad the Wiz is coming back on tour and will be landing in New York City again. I'll be going to see it when it's dur during its New York City leg of the tour w in which Wayne Brady will be playing the Wiz. Huge casting. That's amazing. And I'm, I mean, The Wiz is one of those things that just doesn't come around enough. I can't get enough of this show. Please, please, can we have another Wiz movie too? The Wiz Live was so fabulous. Wiz brought, I'm really excited to see what this production does with it. And I'm hoping it parlays more public attention to The Wiz. Right. And I'm also, I also like to see little differences because there's someone else, again, adapting here and making some, some tweaks and changes. So it's always fun to see what's different. But yeah, this 
is one of my favorite things of all the whiz, like the songs, the story, the, the way the, the cultural impact and significance of it is something that I just adore so much. So I cannot wait to see it. I'm praying that they have all the merch at the tour stuff they're going to have at Broadway. Cause I need the hoodie. I need the mug. I need the magnet or whatever else they have. If they don't, I'm going to be sending you money to send it to me, Tori. So I'm no glad to know that you're going to see it in New York. Right. And then let's just, let's just visit wicked for a minute. You know, Wicked Part One. I mean, we're getting ever closer to the one year mark of it coming out. Um, and hopefully we'll be seeing some some more of that soon. We know that it, they haven't completely finished it because of the writer's strike. They had 10 days reportedly left of filming to complete. And these 10 days were on the one short day number, which takes place in the Emerald City. I know a lot of people were freaking out that they were disassembling the Munchkin Land set in the UK, but they have no further use for it. Now, they had always planned to do reshoots in 2024, but now they'll have to add to that schedule these last 10 days of principal photography as well. If they can, I've been hearing from friends in the biz that like the sag after a strike could continue for another year. And if that's the case, it'll be very interesting to see how they can deliver part one. I mean, if, if principal photography is done on one short day, they might be able to edit and do some CGI wizardry but that's also my favorite number that's my favorite song in from the show it's my favorite moment because you know this is the one moment that we consistently get whether it's the whiz the wizard of oz wicked most uh oz things it's the first time you see the emerald city you know when you get that that's the moment of pure joy pure innocence pure wow and so it's always my favorite place to be transported and if they didn't get everything that they want in John Chu's vision, I really hope they find a way to because I don't want that short changed at all. And I'm sure it won't be. But you know, that's my that's my worry. Well, my thought is 10 days of filming. That's not a whole lot of in terms of if you translate that into minutes of film, that's probably not a lot. It's something they could probably make up for in post production with CGI if they needed to. John Shu seems very confident that the film will still be released on time in 2024. My bigger concern is how will they promote the movie if it's still struck? How will they send the stars out to do premieres and to do press junkets? That's my concern. I'm worried that the right. film will suffer on that end. And it, and it would if, if the strike is still happening. And what's hap what I'm seeing now as in this business is we're not getting actors doing press junkets and things unless there's those exceptions made. We're, we're, we're getting offers to interview people that worked in the crew. So you might get a director or a writer interview. You might get an interview with someone who worked, you know, in the design team, something like that. But actors are still barred, which which is really interesting and and certainly will cause a great effect to how these films are promoted and how well they do ultimately at the box office. So if I could add my two points in terms of the SAG after strike, I actually don't think we'll still be in a strike by then. Recent calculations have come out about how much money the studios have lost as a result of the SAG after strike. And it's actually exponentially more than what the writers and the performers are asking for in these new contracts. All of the major networks are negotiating through the AMPTP and the CEOs of all of these major companies are mostly on the same page that they want to accept these conditions. There's a couple of them that are holding up the whole process and everybody's getting pretty frustrated with everybody else. So I have a feeling that eventually it will be the corporations that crumble first because there is so much public support for SAG-AFTRA and the Writers Guild. I don't think there is any way that they'll be able to continue to push back on these performers, especially after CEOs were caught saying the quiet part out loud. We'll just wait for them to starve and lose their houses and then they'll have to come to the table. The public's not going to stand for that. So I have every confidence that this will be over long before the premiere of Wicked. I certainly hope so. That, yeah, that's not a good look. Tori, this has been so much fun. I'm so glad we're back with Oz Talk. Thank you so much, Ryan. It's always such a joy to talk Oz with you. And check out the Oz Club. It's the International Wizard of Oz Club fan club for all things Oz, bringing fans together since 1957. Head on over to ozclub.org to join now. Well, until next time, thank you so much. And like, share, comment, let us know what you want to talk about, what you're talking about with Oz, so we can talk about it here on Oz Talk. Bye, guys. Bye, guys.